The WP MRR WordPress podcast is brought to you by WP Buffs. WP Buffs manages WordPress websites 24 7 and powers digital growth for agencies, freelancers, and WordPress professionals. Join our white label program, and by next week, you could be offering 24 7 white label website support to your clients and passively growing your monthly recurring revenue. Or become a WP Buffs affiliate to earn 10% monthly payouts every month for the lifetime of every client. And finally, if you're looking to sell your WordPress business or website, check out the WP Buffs acquisition unit. Learn more about all three at WPBuffs.com. All right, we are live on the pod this week with Chris Klasowski. Chris, uh, we know each other from way back in the WordPress scene, and you're not the first Sand Hills person to be on the podcast, but uh, one of my favorite Sand Hills folks. So tell folks a little bit about, yeah, stuff you do at Sand Hills, stuff you do with WordPress. Absolutely. Uh, well, Chris Klasowski is my name, and I am currently the director of technology at Sand Hills Development. Uh, my primary job at the company is overseeing our development teams, uh, building out you know easy digital downloads, affiliate WP, WP Simple Pay, Sugar Calendar, Payout Service, um, kind of the whole gamut of products at Sand Hills. So, um, yeah, I, I lead those teams, help those teams overcome challenges, and and uh, try and keep the stack up and running to make sure that the sites are online. <laughs> Yeah, we were just uh, chatting before we came online here and you showed me your mug, uh, which is very easy ah, to recognize, yes. all the little mon- mug monsters. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, we've got some, we have some like mugs in our online store, but we, we don't have like an avatar anymore. So we don't have like little, like a fun, like cartoon thing to put on a cup. So we just put like our logo on a cup, which is still cool. But I like that you have like... Sandhills has multiple different plugins. You have these multi, like each, and each of each of those has yeah. its own kind of monster match to it. So you can have a cup with all of them on it. So it's like a cool little like uh, nod to all the different brands there. One of my favorite little Easter eggs is we we announced the name of uh, of this of the sugar calendar monster, the orange one here, uh, and her uh, name is Gia G I A. Uh, and oddly enough, without, I mean, whether or not we say it was intentional or not, it, I don't think it necessarily was, is the default date format in WordPress is GIA. So it's, oh. it says PHP format to figure <laughs> out the date, and so it's GIA. I, rumor has it it was intentional slash not intentional, uh-huh. I know, but I love that little fact. That is cool. Nice little Easter egg there. Love that. Cool, man. Um uh, what I wanted to talk about, I mean, we're here just kind of catching up. It's been a little while yeah. since we were talking just before we started here, like since Pressnomics 2018. So it's like since we've seen each other in yeah. real life. It's that been microconf years. that year, yeah. Oh, microconf was it? See, I can't even keep up what yeah, conference I, it was. I think we met at both of them that year. But yeah, microconf, I think it was the last one um, back up in Vegas. So. Yeah, I was looking forward to microconf not being in Vegas. I talked to a few people who are like, well, I personally like I love microconf every year I went, but the like Las Vegas thing always was like, oh, I have to like go to Las Vegas to go to this thing because I'm just a little, it's a little bit too much for me. I feel like I'm a little bit intimidated by like having to go to Las Vegas for a concert like that. It's just I get a little overwhelmed, I think. And I knew sure. as they were trying to plan it for um, Minnesota, I think it was going to be in Minneapolis. Yeah. And I was like, that yeah. sounds way more my speed. <laughs> See, so, for me, it was the opposite. Uh, Vegas oh, really? was nice. It's a, it's a one hour flight for me. Uh, I, can, I There's uh, like 15 flights a day from Phoenix to, to Vegas. So like I can get catch a flight whenever I want. It's an hour. And then Minnesota, at the time they were planning it, the, it was likely going to be snow or at least cold weather. And I, like, I moved from Michigan to Arizona, so I didn't have to deal with cold weather. <laughs> you were like, Peace. So I was like, I'll go because I really want to go, but uh, I don't know that I'm going to like the, the temperature. Yeah, it's funny. Actually, I like warm temperatures, so I didn't even really think about that. I just <laughs> thought about the Vegas thing, but I'm the same way. Yeah. I'm like, summer, like I'm headed back to... Mexico here at the end of this week, so like I'm definitely like okay. warm weather person as well. Uh, but I didn't even think yeah. about that. <laughs> All right, since we last chatted, again it's been a little while, but you've kind of moved into more of a management position at Sandhills, which I kind of wanted to chat about because, man, like managing different development teams that are all doing different kinds of projects that all want some consistency across Mm -hmm. what they're doing in terms of like scalability of the company. I mean, very complex endeavor that you're having to manage all of. Tell me about like the, 
and I'm not super technical, so talk sure. to me like I'm five here. Tell me about <laughs> like the day-to-day work that you're doing uh, at Sandhills now that you're more in like a technical management position. Sure. You know, I think it's interesting. I, I listened to the episode with, that you did with Pippin, and hmm. something that he kind of mentioned too is that we've never really had you know, policies, procedures, like we, we have some procedures outlined, but there's never like, there's not a policy or a process for everything. Uh, and especially as a company growing uh, between four and six people a year, uh, everything's in flux. We're always changing, we're always adjusting, we're always kind of iterating on on the current version of the company. Um, we kind of treat it like software almost where, you know, okay, well this is not working now at our scale, so we'll go ahead and change. Right. So, Previously, I was the lead developer of Easy Digital Downloads. Um, for a while there, I was doing that job and kind of leading the development teams, so splitting my time. I'd love to say 50-50, but we all know how content switching works, and I was really doing like 40-40 with 20% of my time caught up in trying to context switch. Um, and last year, uh, we uh, sold our Restrict Content Pro, one of our products, um, and in the process, Ashley uh, was the lead developer of Restrict Content Pro, became the lead developer of Easy Digital Downloads and took that team over. So that freed me up to actually spend 100% of my time doing the managerial lead type stuff, the management, ah. management side. I don't have a background in management. I don't pretend to be a manager like on TV, uh, but you know, it's. I figured there's a lot you can learn from listening to smart people. So when I first took over the role, uh, I just dove into reading, and I'm not a reader. Uh, Books like Manager's Path, Leaders Eat Last, that kind of stuff. Just figuring out what management was. And then I realized that managing is different for every person. Uh, You have to figure out what type of manager you want to be, what type of team you want to lead. Uh, so we actually ended up hiring in uh, at the company. We invested in um, a confidence coach, which is really more like leadership training. Because most of being a leader is about figuring out confidence in who you are and the decisions you make. So I spent uh, like we spent eight weeks each uh, talking to our confidence coach and learning about our leadership styles and our management styles and who we want to be and what values we hold. Uh, and cool. then forming kind of like our our mantras. So now my day to day is very different than what it was six to eight months ago because having learned all that, uh, a lot of it's checking in with the development teams. Uh, I have leads, uh, and then I meet with them twice a week or twice a month in one on ones. I meet with um, skip level one on ones once a month just to kind of get a pulse on how the team is feeling, what they need from me. If there's anything process wise we can uh, adjust, I spend a lot of time. Um, looking over what's happening, making sure everyone's on task, making sure that you know when people are out on vacation that they're covered, that we have proper uh, coverage for the products when someone's out. Um, last year, I spent a lot of time writing up what I call our development values. Um, our size company, mm-hmm. we don't. Uh, if you read our website, you know we're all about our team. That's our focus. So I spent a lot of my time figuring out how to make my team effective and productive without overwhelming them with the day-to-day stuff. So I find myself doing a lot of that. Yeah, cool. I, I feel like we're very team focused here at WP Buffs and maybe not like, maybe not directly modeled off of Sandhills, but I always had Sandhills in mind when I was thinking about like the company is like, I kind of wanted to try and emulate, not copy and paste, but to try and like push towards that same, in that same direction other companies did. Sandhills was always one of those companies. So I kind of give Sandhills a little bit of credit for like, well, that's, I feel like our focus has on being so team focused has kind of come from Sandhills. So I think you you all do a great job over there. I I want to dive a little bit more into the coaching piece of things because uh, as you know, probably I talk to Kyle pretty frequently and I'm, I'm, WP Buffs is going through this kind of transition, which I'm sure Sandhills has gone through the same thing. I actually kind of talked with Pippin about this a little bit when he did his podcast episode here about kind of like my role as a CEO changing as the company is growing and just about how a lot of things are changing at this point in WP Buffs. Like we're having to make a lot of adjustments, both like team wise, uh, systems wise, like across a lot of different areas. And 
I found that I needed some help with that. So I actually talked to Kyle and he was like, oh, there's this, uh, there's this, this coach, her name's Carla, mm-hmm. she's great, uh, you should talk with her. Uh, and I chatted with her once and n- now I work with her on an ongoing basis. We're actually skipping yep. this week. Uh, she's mm-hmm. taking a little bit of a long weekend. Uh, and we do only three out of four weeks we touch base. But anyway... I think yeah. she's who you're talking about when you're talking about yep. the person who you were, you were who you worked with. So it's kind of funny, a little bit of overlap. Here's there's a hot tip for folks listening. You know, if other people, someone, yeah. if other successful companies have things that work for them, you can ask for a contact. Uh, and so that's what happened with me. And she's been really cool for me. I want to. I'd like to dive a little bit more into kind of how. Uh, you know, maybe not specifics because, you know, I think sure. there's a lot of around coaching that's pretty unique to the individual and that uh, honestly should be more, bet- you know, between the coach and the individual. But I'd love to know yeah. maybe just some of like the the things you came out with from those coaching sessions that like kind of helped you become a better leader from someone who didn't do a ton of leadership or people management before. Like anything that really stood out is something that you're like, oh, that was super helpful. What's interesting about it is uh, I don't know that she ever, I, I don't know that I won't say like specifically, but I, I almost feel, and I always related it to like therapy. It's not actually therapy and it's not a therapeutic session, but a lot of the times uh, the key is finding the right person to ask you the right questions. And I felt like she knew the right questions to ask to get me to start talking myself into an answer. Uh, mm. A lot of times I'd be talking and talking and talking and like in the, <laughs> in the point of the moment, be like, oh my God, that's the answer. Like, thank yeah. you. You directed <laughs> me the right way. Um, get, and there's something empowering about that. And it's empowering to, when you empower someone to answer their own question, to, to come to the end result on their own, wh- you led them there, but they got there and said it themselves. I think it's an empowering moment. So, um, a lot of the things we talked about, especially the first couple of weeks, uh, was the hardest part for me because it was figuring out my my style, my management style, my values, I guess is the core. What do I value? You know, obviously you can have a list of like 30 things you want to be, but at the core of it, you really only have like three or four values that you want to uphold. Um, you know, transparency, honesty, um, things like that. So uh, getting to the bottom of that and why those are my values were interesting. You know, we took a, a long look at we talked about some of the managers I'd had in the past through my development career, what I liked about them, what I didn't like about them, things like that. And, and it wasn't like a gripe session. It was just what things did they do well for you specifically and what things did you feel like they, they fell short on. And uh, that was really eye-opening for me to realize the things I valued were still values of my own. And uh, how can I kind of expose those and actually use them in my current role uh, was really interesting. Um, the next one was really figuring out uh, self-care. Uh, I think there's a lot of challenges around self-care when it comes to being a manager. You know, um, so much of your time is spent making sure everyone else has what they need uh, that sometimes you forget to stop and, and take care of yourself. There's a quote like, you can't pour from an empty cup, I think is the quote. And it, the reality is it's true. If you don't take time to like refill your own cup, you have nothing else to give. So we talked a lot about that. I'm that's probably the part that when Carla and I talk again, it's going to be how are you doing on self care, and I'm going to just be honest and fail. Like I'm failing on that. I'm not a really good self care person um, right now. I'm trying to. I'm reading a book called um, Smarter, Better, Faster. I think is I. I always get it mixed up with the Daft Punk song because yeah. it's kind of got the same mantra. <laughs> I was just thinking I think that the Daft Punk song. I think it's called Smarter, Better, Faster, but it's a it's a productivity book, and it's about uh-huh. finding the ways to be product, pr- uh, productive and, and self productivity and and uh, being able to analyze what's on your plate, what needs to be done, and finding that time for yourself. So, yeah, yeah, I, I like a lot what you said about how Carl always asks you the right questions. I I feel the exact same way. I like self-discover my own answers very often. And we talk a lot about, um, like getting clarity on things because the way my brain works is, is like my brain is always, it's always moving like a hundred miles an hour. It feels like on this, on that. I'm always thinking about stuff in the business because it's, it's one, it's probably just like how my brain works. And two, I'm kind of obsessed with it. Like I want to do it. Like I'm always enjoying that thought process. Uh, 
but that doesn't mean my like actions necessarily need to have that same pace. And that's a lot right. of what I'm working on. Cause that was actually really helpful for the business. Like three years ago, it was like, right. We can be agile. We can move fast. We can like do a lot of stuff. Like that's our advantage. And now, you know, we're not a big company, but we're a more mature company. And I can't just like, just go like move super fast on a bunch of different stuff as much as I wanted to before because there right. are so many more ripple effects. So like getting clarity on situations, being patient in terms of timing and and looking at things more on a month to month basis and even like year to year basis, not necessarily like what do I need to get done today? Like, do I really have to get that done today? Well, maybe it's okay to get some consensus on that and move it forward and stuff. And so yeah. that so getting clarity, like we kind of talk about like lifting the fog up so you we can actually like having having clarity on the direction we're going in and kind of knowing knowing what's real in my thought process. Hmm, yeah. That's kind of an odd way to say it. Knowing what is truly a factor and what is just my brain like playing games with the me. Thought you know, like, the thought distortions. Are you to thought distortions distortion. yet? Yes. Totally. <laughs> that's my, that's my, my favorite lot, keyword apparently. from her is the thought distortion. Oh, I do too. Uh, her, her, the concept of thought distortion. You know, things that are in your head that like if you just ask the question you'll get the answer to but we try and figure it out ourselves without asking a question. So it, that's a really fun one. That was actually probably the biggest one that affected me was figuring that out. Um, are, were you, are you, okay, let me, are you, or were you a bullet journaler? I was not a bullet journaler, but I was a okay. Pomodoro on and okay. off journaler. So one of the things that I found super helpful as like, as the company got bigger and my role got more big picture than day-to-day operations, I had to stop giving myself daily tasks it was not productive. It was actually counterproductive to my mental state because my anxiety drove so high that I didn't get the one thing, two things, three things. Because the, the, all those productivity actually were like, put three things on your thing for today and get those three That's things done. That's what Pomodoro is, yeah. Yeah, and the reality is so much of my day is reactive than proactive. Mm. Um, someone needs me to look at something. Someone needs something taken care of. And it's hard to plan for those. So what I ended up switching to was uh, this week. So I actually have a Kanban board. I've got a backlog. I've got a next week. I've got a this week. I've got an in-flight and I've got a completed. And I'll move things from, like if it comes up, I put it in this week and mm-hmm. I will get to it this week. If I don't get to it this week, I drop it in next week. And then when my Monday starts, I just move things over to the column. Uh, if I start cool. something that's going to take some long time, and the, the reason I like that is too, uh, is I can put comments on it. So if I put, if I start the process of something, which is reach out to someone about a topic, move it to in flight, write the date and time I contacted them, the information I've asked yeah. them, wait for a response, and then I have a log of what I've done um, for the process. So one of the things that we talked about was that, like figuring out my new, my new daily normal, which was far more reactive than proactive. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that, that honestly, it goes back to knowing like how you work and what are your stressors and how do you want to be a manager? So I think a lot of times that's the hardest part. There are a thousand, there are 10,000 different ways to be a good manager, right? Everybody's going to be a little different. And probably the most important part is to like have that discovery session like you had and like really like figure out one, how, how you want to do things, how you're, you, the unique person that you are, are going to be the best possible manager. And like, what are your personal strengths and weaknesses in terms of managing and just being a person so you can like be the most effective manager, but also like right. how to match that with like work, what works well within your team and finding probably some compromises along the way. But like, this is all also part of like, like I think about it as like you, you're building the plane as it's taking off on the runway. Like it's almost <laughs> right. impossible to do in a vacuum. You can't just like, you know, it's like, I think about it like another parallel is like the, the like quarterback on like the college team. They're not going to wait to like their senior year, the final game to like throw that last perfect touchdown pass. And like that's it. It's like you go through your right. freshman year and you kind of, you know, get sacked a lot and you kind of get better. And then sophomore year you get a little better. And so it's, you practice, you move forward and back, but like not doing in a vacuum, I think is the most important part you learn from doing in most, at least my perspective. I don't know what, if you feel the same, way. I'm not a huge football person, but there's another. I, I understand the <laughs> rules and the way that plays are called, and I think another important factor of that is as you become more experienced. To use another football analogy, so hopefully it doesn't like nice. take away from too many people. But as you be become more comfortable with your style, with your process, you're able to call the audibles better. You know, as mm-hmm. as a young 
person taking totally. in your, in young in your career, I guess I would say not young person, but when you're young in your career in the position, sometimes it's hard to know and to say, I'm noticing something happening. I need to quickly change this direction. Um, and whether that's a pride thing, just an experience thing or an yeah. ego thing, eventually you, you know, you can see the signs that it's time to, to make a quick change on the fly. Yeah. I like, I feel like I'm decent at kind of knowing when something isn't working optimally yeah. or a system isn't working optimally. I think where I, I still personally need help with is like, okay, how do I take that into my team needs and my current team systems and make change that's not going to like grind anybody else's gears, yeah. but that I can still make change over time, but that works within our current workflow and system. Like that is still a cha- I think it's just like a challenge. I think that I'm like personally facing, but also just like as a team, as we're like making system and operation and documentation changes as we're like hitting this next level of business. It's like everything is a little bit like, feels a little bit like juggled up in the air and we're like trying to f- see where pieces fit back. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, there's an interesting book called Switch um, that talks about why change is hard. Uh, and it ties back to the fact that our brains um, find ways, once we kind of get set into a process, our fi- our, our brain starts shutting off the logical or the uh the emotional side of it and just follow the path. Like I, I used to have an hour and a half commute, uh, about, depending on traffic, all the way up to Scottsdale when I, wor- when I worked for a local company. And I literally, there were days where like, I know I'm paying attention, it's not like it completely blanked, but my brain just knew the path to work. I just knew the path. I knew the path. And if mm-hmm. the first day there's a huge traffic incident, like it took some stress on me to find a new path. But then I had that backup path next time there's an accident. And eventually, when things change completely and that path is no longer the way, your brain has to think again, uh, which is what makes change so hard. It makes it hard to, as we're growing as companies, the changes that we're implementing affect our team in more than just productivity, but we're asking their brains to find a new way to do something. And that takes an emotional draw for a bit. So knowing that this might not work right away, um, but like once we can get it into our brains that this is how we're going to do it, and we kind of like get past that first emotional shift, um, we can we can actually see if it's working or not. Yeah, yeah. I think it makes me think about how we kind of think about work at WP Buffs and we like to have we like to give people structure and give people systems in which to work because that means it doesn't require brain power to like kind of figure out the systems around something right you can actually like use your brain power to actually solve the problem you're working on or the big challenge you're you're up against but if you do that like too like if you give too much structure it's just kind of like it, it almost turns into like a checklist and you're just kind of like it becomes almost that that drive to work every day take the same path and then you kind of automatically do it and then don't think as much about it, which also could have a negative because it could get boring. It could just be the same thing you do every day. So like, I don't know, as a manager, if you've found that you're trying to give people systems, you're trying to give people processes and, and trying to give people structure, but not trying to like yeah. over structure people. Is that something that you've run into or? That was kind of the goal with the development values. So back in January of twenty. 20- 20. I, I penned what is now a document internally called our development values. I'm, I'm trying to write a blog post about it. It's turning out to be more difficult. I've apparently lost the, 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 the writing bug um, or the skill. So I need to get that back. Uh, the idea is there are a lot of companies out there that you write code this way. You name things this way. You format your code this way. You do things this way. You execute this way. And you release this way. And what we found was one of the challenges with being so strict on that is it doesn't leave room for the fact that each person writing, reading, maintaining our code is a human. Um, we now have all the way from uh, like an junior level one to two, all the way up to senior level six. So we, we've got a wide range of developers within our team and each one of them is very skilled, but they all work in different, you know, time frames. They all have different skill sets. They all have either come from a different background or whatever. But what we need to do is come up with a set of values that say, I'm not telling you have to write code this way. I'm telling you when challenged with 
uh, uh, cha- when challenged with something in the code, whether it's formatting, uh, the way we write it, the naming conventions, com- backwards compatibility, when challenged with that, we fall back to these values. And it's things like readability over um, complexity, maintainability, uh, com- backwards compatibility. We make these decisions as a team. I'm not telling you you have to do it this way. If you don't like the way something in our coding kind of standards are, let's talk about it and let's figure out what the team thinks. And if we all come to a, like a, a majority agreement that we need, need to do it that way, then we can do it that way. But the biggest ones, I just want it to be readable. I want people to be able to jump into the code at any level in our team and be able to read the code and not have to ask questions about what it means. Um, so uh, that was probably the biggest one. It was, I'm not... I, I like to equate it to, it's like a lot of people say, I'm putting you on the rails, like you stay on the railroad and you can only really follow the railroad and every now and then you can fork off and go one way or another way. Mm-hmm. I kind of like to think it's more like the, the the water rides where you're kind of in this to this this path <laughs> and it you know how it bounces side to side a little uh, bit so like you yeah, don't yeah. really stay on the rails you've got a little bit of leeway back and forth but it keeps us all heading in the same direction uh is really the key yep yeah i think the what you said about values there is really important because i think when a lot of people think about values they think about um like i want to create company values so that like i can run a good company so that my company can be value driven um which of course is important. I'm I'm not saying that's not important. I think that's a great asset of having values to make sure everybody on your team knows like we have values here. We don't, you know, do things that uh, you know, could maybe move us farther ahead, but that aren't doing good in the world. Like that's important. Mm-hmm. But another really important aspect is that it gives everybody on the team a fallback on which to uh it, it, it gives people a way to think about how they're doing their work and the direction in general they need to right. kind of vector in. And as a manager, that's like your your job, right? You have, you know, 20 people working under you, maybe not reporting to you directly, but like maybe under your tree of, mm-hmm. of reports. All those people, you like, your job is kind of help all those people move in the same direction, in the direction the company wants to go. And the values should help lead them there theoretically. So even if everybody's doing things slightly differently, they still have that, you know, backwards compatibility thing in mind, value mm-hmm. in mind, so that when their work is done, they submit it, well they know they followed that task. So theoretically, everybody who's working on it may do backwards think about backwards compatibility a mm-hmm. little bit differently, but that's still something that is a core of core importance to your team. So I think there right. that that's something I I think is like it's it's a it's not the first thing I think people think about when they think about value driven, but it is really especially as you grow, you know, you've got you've got a lot of people on the team now. How do you yeah. keep everyone moving in that same direction? Value is so important for that. Yep. Well, and it means I don't have to be part of the decision process. You know, I've got like a, a lead developer for affiliate AP and a lead developer for easy digital downloads, and they both have two developers underneath them. Well, one of them has three, one has two. And it means that when someone's reviewing code, we can fall back on the values. If if uh, someone's reviewing a pull request, a, a code change, and says, you know, I, that that might break backwards compatibility, or I think we can make this easier to read and maintain going down further down the road. If we make these small changes, uh, it, it means as you're reviewing change sets, as you're reviewing code changes, we we have these things in mind. We don't necessarily have a checklist, isn't it? Like, is this backwards compatible? Is this maintainable? Is this? It is just. It's buried in our subconscious of when we're working. This is the direction we're going. These are the values we hold. Now let's do the work with those in mind. Yeah, very cool. The other thing you're kind of mentioning a lot is kind of the names of books and things you've learned from yeah. from reading books. <laughs> I've I, I I'm always interested to hear how people who are doing more management um, like treat their learning and self education. I've always felt like me personally. Like when I get into reading those books, I'm like skipping between like 10 books at once because I just like, I almost get like a little bored in one book or I lose yeah. interest because I can't quite get there again. This is just like me personally. I feel like when I listen to podcasts, I can get like a bite sized piece and like I like to hear stories of other people doing things because that to me gives me a more like, it gives me a more like tangible, like how 
did this work like within the context of a business? And sometimes books mm-hmm. don't always give me that. They're almost like this like case study of like, that's kind of like, oh, this isn't super relevant to my business or like that's a Fortune 500 business, not our company. That's not really relevant to me. But I know so many people who are like devour all these books and like get a lot of great ideas and thoughts about them. I guess you're kind of more of like a, a book person or do you listen to any podcast or anything like that? I would say I don't devour books. I am a very slow reader. Um, <laughs> I'm getting better. I'm getting better. Uh, I used to love podcasts um, when I commuted. Mm-hmm. I listened to podcasts all the time. Um, now my commute is to my office and my house. So uh, I have found that the problem with podcasts that I have personally is Everyone always treats them and says, oh, well, you can just listen to your podcast while you're working out, or you can listen to your podcast while you're doing the dishes. You can. I've got three kids, two dogs in my house, and if, I am on, if I'm trying to listen to a podcast, I find myself typically um, wandering to do something else and mm. getting distracted and missing key points. So uh, mm-hmm. that is not a medium that necessarily works for my brain, which is why I fell back to books. And I would say I'm not a great fast reader, but uh, every now and then if a book doesn't hit me, I just put it down and start a different one and and I come back to it. So um, it's been a challenge. Uh, I, I've been using, I've tried both physical books. I've tried the eBooks. I tend to do better with physical books. Um, ebooks are nice cause I can write notes and like highlight things, which is really cool. I don't like to write in books. It just still feels, I know I own it, but it still feels weird to write in a book. <laughs> but yeah. Can transport I, you back to like fourth grade. Like you're not supposed to write in a book. Like, Oh no, it's a library book. <laughs> I just feel like I just paid money for this and I'm writing all over it. Although the, I, the irony is my, my grandfather was an author and when he, when he passed, we started taking his book collection and, and parts of the family were grabbing it. And I, I grabbed some books out of it and, mm. uh, and I keep them in my collection. And I was reading one one day and I found like his cliff notes, like he would just write notes in the sidebars, yeah. which is really an interesting thing. Cause it's kind of like getting an idea totally. where he was mentally at when reading it. And, uh, but I'm like, okay, well if he wrote in books and he was an author, then it's probably okay to write your notes in the books. Mm. There you go. I, I'm the same way with like, I, I read a lot of, I, I do read a pretty good amount, but I read a lot of fiction. <laughs> so I read a lot of sci-fi okay. and that is like where my Kindle is like, boom, love it. Yeah. But I have trouble reading like business books in my Kindle because I don't love the note taking experience. It's yeah. too um, clunky. But right. honestly, I feel that not that the note taking functionality it, for podcasts is clunky. It's almost that it doesn't exist. I really right. wish there was a better way to take notes for podcasting because I'm the same way as you are. Like I can't do, I couldn't listen to a podcast and do work at the same time or, right. or hang out at the same time. Like I'm usually listening to podcasts so I'm like walking the dog or like when I'm out for a walk or when I'm doing something where I can specific, like I can actively listen. But yep. I wish that there was a better way than just like go to the, like the podcast notes section uh, where I could really dig into or like take my own notes. And I don't even really know what that what that is because I feel like I ha- I listen to something like for 30 seconds in an episode. I'm like, ooh, I have this really interesting idea. Do I like need like an audio journal yeah. or do I need something like right. faster to type it out without there's having your, like unlock my phone? There's your new phone? business right there. I, that, there, I think there that's a go. billion dollar business for sure. <laughs> like if you could make note taking, because everyone, I, I, I feel like, there's a, I've missed a lot of important stuff from podcasts. Yeah. Like I get a pretty good it's amount when I'm too. actually listening, but yeah, but you miss things that you don't like, if you don't write it down in that second, like it's kind of gone and like, or are you going to like go rewind 30 seconds? Like two weeks later when you're like, Oh, I want to go back and remember that. It's like, it's kind of lost at that point, you know? So that's yeah. Tough. It'd be nice if just like tapping your ear, your AirPod thing, just like made a marker. Like seriously, here we oh, go. Hey, podcast. There, go. there we go. Boom. <laughs> you were given, we're yeah, you're right. I mean, here. I am a book person. It's a, I, I never thought I would be, honestly. I used to read a lot as a kid, then I stopped and, and uh, I started reading books to my kids at, at night before bed. And that made me start to read better, um, be a little more, um, I don't know. I was just so slow. I got hung up on words. Uh, it's, and it's not like I can't read, it's just my brain just doesn't want wouldn't settle down to read. So it's, it's been getting better. Uh, I'm reading, you know, a little faster now. Yeah. Do you feel like it's, do you feel like you want to read faster because you just like want to get more information or do you feel like it's just kind of like a 
personal. I think it's self conscious. Like, yeah, I feel like I'm just beating myself up as I'm reading about how slow it is. Like, but the other part of it is you have to make sure, especially with you know, um, like fiction doesn't work well for me because I get lost in the story and my brain starts creating the world in my head, and then I get distracted by the world in my head. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> so business books are great, but like I have to find myself actually intentionally reading and and not just reading the words, but mm. like uh, committing parts of it to memory and kind of understanding the story. And I'll have to stop frequently to make sure I can process what I'm reading, which is part of it. Yeah. Too, so, yeah. I think it's interesting. The uh, this I think in some ways reading slower actually can have a big advantage. I think like there's this whole speed reading thing out there, and I never really yeah. got into that. I honestly I'm somewhat similar in the fact that I'm not like a super fast reader. My wife is super fast reader. She'll finish a book like in a day, and I'm like, how did you do that? Yeah, like Jill I is can't too. even. Yep. I can't literally not do that. But with business books, I really feel like. How I get them, how I've gotten the most out of business books is if I read like, honestly, it's length too. If I like sat down and read a, read a business book for two hours, I'd f- like close it and be like, okay, my brain's kind of fried right now. I don't really know what I just read. Like, I know it was a bunch of important stuff, but it's kind of like that's <laughs> kind of the extent yeah. to which I know. I actually think I get more out if I like spend a half an hour reading slowly and then actually like put it down and not read anymore and maybe go yep. take some notes or maybe go. Honestly, like sit back and do nothing for half an hour, think about it, give myself some space to noodle it because what's the point of reading that if I don't like actually like think about it in my context, in the context of WP Buffs and you in the context of Sandhills, like that's where the actual application comes in. So I might take advantage of that slow reading a little bit. Maybe that'll actually, yeah. maybe that would give you more of an effect or something. Maybe it's your advantage, your secret, secret sauce. <laughs> yeah. The key is just make stop beating myself about like because that's I, again I, like a lot of it is I just look at myself how slow I'm reading and I'm like oh like I watch I watch Jill uh, my wife over there reading a book and she, she has a book club and she read a book in like 24 hours and I'm like I can't brain reading a book in 24 hours like uh, it just doesn't work for me um, but you know you're right maybe it's my pop, maybe my superpower is that my slow reading just means I commit things to memory I wish that was it. Yeah. <laughs> I, as I as I continue to get older, I continue to take some of the things I feel like I'm not as good at and I try to spin them around. I'm like, well, you know, there maybe you silver lining. Hey, maybe there's something there good go. about this too. Cool. Uh, all right. Well, how what is what does the rest of this year look like for you, man? Are you uh, just kind of continuing on work? Sounds like you got some family stuff going on too. We're starting to like hopefully get back to a new normal in terms of yeah. life here in the world in the U.S. post Post COVID, I hate I hesitate to say post yet, but we're, we're yeah, for right. sure on our way there. How Hopefully. are you feeling about the rest of the, rest of the year? I'm feeling pretty good. I I've got a couple of things. So I mean, we homeschool uh, our, our our boys. So um, mm. there's some interesting things that my uh, that Jill has started with that. So a lot of my free time is going to be hopefully helping get that started and going and managing the website and building out custom stuff for her for that. So that's part of my free time is going to be doing that. <laughs> At Sand Hills wise, you know, we've got, you know, EDD 3.0 coming up, which is a huge thing that I started the development on and now Ashley's going to finish up. You know, we did our first beta not too long ago. Second beta will be coming soon. Nice. It's a big shift in in almost actually it's a big shift for WordPress e-commerce plugins in general. Uh, we'll be one of the first ones to move to custom tables for everything, which is a huge challenge. Um, you know, Sugar Calendar's got some cool add-ons coming out soon. Uh, Philly P with the portal and a couple major release versions coming out. So there's a lot happening, a lot to keep track of. Um, right now, the rest of my year is really figuring out how to keep empowering these these teams to to keep producing at the rate they are. Uh, I'm every day I'm impressed with the work that gets done um, and how little they need me anymore for the day-to-day stuff, which is it feels terrible and awesome at the same time to be like, wow, all that got pushed and I didn't touch any of it. Um, barely looked at it uh, from a code perspective. I'd never looked over like the main issues and the, and the, the roadmaps and things, but uh, it feels good to see and continue to empower these teams to just keep producing at the rate they are. So finding ways to keep doing that is a big one. Just keep building out tooling for them, keep making their lives easier, keep um, making it so they don't have to think so much about the process and just get the work done. Yep. Awesome, man. You're doing, uh, you're, you're, 
doing the manager role justice. So keep keep rocking and rolling. So. Why don't you tell <laughs> why don't you um, tell folks where they can like find you online, find Sandhill stuff online, all that jazz. Yeah. Uh, well, our main site, sandhillsdev.com. Um, you can learn about our company, what we stand for, our values, and a little bit about what we're doing. Um, I love the storyline on our About Us page. It tells the kind of the history of Sand Hills, and, and that's one of my favorite pages on there because it's got everyone's faces. And every now and then I, I, I go back to that page and I remember when it was just so much smaller. So sandhillsdev.com is where you can find our company. Um, I'm primarily on Twitter, at C. Klosowski. First initial, last name, um, and that's that's pretty much where I spend my time these days. I don't social too much anymore. Uh, I found it super draining, um, but I still like to get involved every now and then with conversations and trying to get a little bit more involved in the, the manager leader space there. Um, make my wave somehow. Cool, man. Sounds good. Uh, last but not least, I like to ask our guests to ask our listeners for a little Apple Podcast review. So if you wouldn't mind asking folks to leave us a quick review, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, if you get anything out of the podcast that you're listening to, leave a comment, give a rating. They help a ton with the algorithms and it lets Joe know whether or not you're liking what he's doing. So go leave a review, get in there, get your voice heard and uh, bring up some topics to talk about. Yes, appreciate it, man. WPMRR.com forward slash review takes you right to uh, Apple Podcast if you are on a Mac uh, or Apple device. If you are a new listener to the show, go binge some old episodes. We've got 150-ish older episodes uh, about all sorts of topics. MRR, churn, lifetime value, management, hiring, anything you have questions about in terms of running a business, go use the search function on WPMRR.com forward slash podcast. Uh, Go check out some older episodes. Uh, Cool. That is it for this week on the podcast. We will be in your earbuds again next Tuesday. Chris, thanks again for being on, man. It's been real. Thank you, man. Later, everybody. See ya.